And now for our feature presentation. <laughs> uh, the Stephen Paget Memorial Lecture celebrates the life of Stephen Paget, who passionately believed that a greater understanding of physiology would lead to better medical science. He was a founder of Research Defense Society, which later became Understanding Animal Research. And this year, we're delighted to celebrate the 86th Paget Lecture, adding Professor Amrita Alawalia to our long and eminent list of lecturers. Amrita is Dean for Research in the Faculty of Medical and Dent uh, Medicine and Dentistry at the Barts in London College, uh, School of Medicine and Dentistry, Director of the UK CRC accredited Barts Cardiovascular Clinical Trials Unit, and Professor of Vascular Pharmacology at Queen Mary University of London, where she's Principal Investigator, leading the Vascular Pharmacology Group. Her research focuses on understanding the role of inflammation in cardiac and va vascular disease with a focus on non-canonical pathways for nitrous oxide generation and delineating the mechanisms that underlie sex differences in cardiovascular physiology and disease. Throughout her career, Amrita has persistently raised awareness on the sex bias in experimental work, increased diversity and representation in biomedical science, promoted responsible animal research, and nurtured the next generation of researchers. She was a project license holder for over 15 years, and her seven years as editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Pharmacology, she helped to generate an incredible amount of practical and internationally relevant guidance on animal experimentation. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Amrita Alawalia and her lecture, Sex and Drugs, My Rock and Roll. Thank you very much for that really very kind uh, introduction. It's a massive honour to be delivering this lecture this evening. Um, I had a look at the website and saw the list of the previous recipients, uh, full of the great and good in biomedical research and in vivo research in particular. Uh, it's a massive honour. I'm chuffed to bits, in actual fact, to be the newest name on that list. So thank you very much to those who nominated me and thank you uh, to the UAR for awarding me this honor. I have a list of, I'm just trying to see the mouse, of disclosures at the bottom, hmm, I can't see it, at the bottom of my slide. It's the final one on that list that's relevant for my presentation today and you'll re uh, understand uh, the relevance as I go through my talk. But before I start talking about sex and drugs, I thought I would share with you some observations that I've made uh, when I was doing a little bit of research in preparation for this lecture. Uh, seems that, despite appearances, uh, that Stephen Paget and I have rather a lot in common. Um, both of us actually trained at the same medical school. Stephen Paget uh, moved to St. Bart's Medical College in 1878 to study medicine. Uh, I didn't bump into him in the corridors when I was there. I, I arrived, I know I've got a lot of white hair here, I'm not quite that old. I arrived in 1989 to do my PhD under the supervision of Professor Rod Flower. In doing my research as well, I came across some really interesting facts that I thought I'd share with you that have some relevance to my presentation today. So Stephen Paget was one of four sons of James Paget. And James Paget was, was actually the very first warden of the first residential medical college at Barts. He took on this role in 1844, and he was obviously a really forward thinker for his time. Uh, by 1850, he had recruited the first ever, or allowed the first ever woman to attend uh, uh, training within a medical school in the UK. Uh, sadly, the, those that followed him didn't really follow in his footsteps. Uh, her name was Elizabeth Blackwell. She was the first and the last woman for some time at Bart's Medical School. She be actually became a leading light in women's rights and women's lib. In the United States, she set up medical school and she had a, a very prolific and successful career leading equality for women. Uh, I'm sure James Paget, however, 
would be very happy with the current circumstances at the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. I think I'm a good reflection of the way that the medical school looks today. I'm currently the Dean of Research in the Faculty, and I think that's testament to some major changes that have taken place. Secondly, uh, both Stephen Paget and I have an interest in typhoid vaccine. I'll explain to you during my talk um, how uh, my interests originated and how I've used typhoid vaccine as part of an experimental, as, as an experimental tool in studies in, in healthy volunteers. But Stephen Paget um, was a massive proponent of vaccination against, uh, to protect against typhoid fever. Uh, in this, his famous book, Experiment on Animals, he published this chapter specifically focused on typhoid vaccination. And uh, he, he actually reported some of the experiments and data that led up to rollouts of vaccination, particularly at a time when it was needed with the infantry that were fighting in battles. Um, and this just highlights uh, the section that I wanted to bring to your attention. It says, good luck attend all 18 of them. These were the first individuals ever to receive typhoid vaccine. It was an experiment. Uh, it was in army personnel. And another interesting fact, actually the majority of them were Indian medical officers. Um, so good luck attend all 18 of them and immunity against typhoid wherever they are. The doses that they received were estimated in proportion to the dose that would kill a guinea pig of 350 to 400 grams weight. I think uh, this book was published in, 19, in 1900 and it is a testament to Stephen Paget's um, uh, promotion of the importance of early uh, studies in animals that then are translated into the clinical setting, the importance of how effective they can be in providing us good guidance on what to do next when we go into humans. And I've taken this translational approach to um, my research in my laboratory and almost everything that I do in, anim in the animal experimental <coughs> setting, I take into the clinical setting, find ways of simulating the experiments in humans. Uh, I'm also interested in supporting best practice animal research. It's a given that Stephen Paget was interested in that. And um, uh, in the main, my opportunity to promote good practice came during my tenure as editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Pharmacology. I did that job for seven years. I had an absolutely top-notch editorial board uh, and an even better I mean, could it be possible? Yes, it could. Senior editorial board. And with all of their hard work together with me, we generated a number of pragmatic, internationally relevant guidelines for biomedical researchers doing preclinical research. Many of those guidelines actually focused on animal experimentation. And today, towards the end of my talk, I'm just going to share one of the specific initiatives that we launched during my tenure. Um, focused on the subject matter of my lecture today. So sex and drugs. I thought that I should probably declare from the get-go that this is not going to be a racy talk. And my sincerest apologies. The drugs that I'm going to talk about are the ones that I used in my experimental uh, methods in animals, animal tissues, to explore signaling pathways that govern cardiovascular physiology, but also to identify potential therapeutic targets for cardiovascular disease. The sex that I'm going to talk about is actually the difference between males and females. So apologies again, it's not going to be racy, but I hope that uh, it will be an, at least interesting and illuminating and perhaps even entertaining. So why am I interested in the cardiovascular system? Well, it's because cardiovascular disease, CVD, is a major killer in the UK. Uh, if you look at the, I can't get the mouse to work here. Um, whoops, there we go. So uh, this is data that is published by the British Heart Foundation on an annual basis. This is the data for 2023. Um, you can see here that they, the BHF uh, state here that 25% of all mortality in the UK in 2023 will be due to cardiovascular disease. This is uh, a frightening number. It's um, number two 
in uh, the major killers in the UK, with cancer being the top at the moment, just a percent or two more. But I think the number that's probably more frightening is this one. Seven, over seven and a half million people are actually living with cardiovascular disease. And I think this number actually highlights the importance of continued efforts to try and identify novel therapeutics to address this uh, endemic, uh, epidemic uh, situation that we have with, with CVD in the UK. But it's not just in the UK. This is the Global Burden of Disease data set uh, that was um, funded by the Gates Foundation, published in The Lancet. And you can see here that it's not, cardiovascular disease is not just a disease of high income countries, but we see very high um, cause for mortality in middle and low income countries. And whilst it's true that cardiovascular disease mortality is actually decreasing in Western countries and in high income countries, it is completely the opposite in low and middle income countries. Big issue that we still have to grapple with. This is some additional data that's come from the BHF, uh, and it is just to highlight the key aspect of my talk today. This shows the deaths by cause in the United Kingdom in 2019, and the data is disaggregated. It's not often that you see disaggregated data uh, in, between men and women. And if you look at the top um, uh, data set, this is all cause mortality. And you can see I've highlighted there, there's an interesting phenomenon that's taking place. You can see that there's approximately double the number of men in the early age ranges um, dying in comparison to women. And what you start to see as we age, that the numbers start to converge. There's many men and women um, uh, dying, but then you start to see that the numbers of women eclipse the men. Well, what's causing this uh, apparent sex difference. What diseases are driving this? Well, I can tell you that it's not cancer. So whilst men and women suffer different types of cancer, actually the total mortality is pretty much, in terms of numbers in the UK, the same. So while the actual type of cancer is different, mortality is equal between the sexes. That is not the case with cardiovascular disease. I've highlighted the data here. What you can see that um, as we age, that there is almost, well, there's double, sometimes even triple the numbers of men dying of CVD in comparison to women. That the numbers start to converge as we age, and then you start to see women, uh, the numbers of deaths in women eclipsing those in men. There's been an enormous amount of research, epidemiological research, interrogating these kind of data. And it's clear that women have a sort of a 10-year advantage on uh, our male counterparts, and that this is in pre-menopausal women. But once women pass through the menopause, that that protection seems to disappear in terms of cardiovascular disease. And there's been an enormous amount of preclinical and clinical research that has implicated uh, female sex hormones and particularly estrogen in providing the protective effects during the pre-menopausal years. In my group, we have focused on assessing some of the causes of this sex difference, and I'm going to share some of that data with you today. Um, what we know is that cardiovascular disease mortality, there is one big risk factor. It's hypertension. Hypertension drives um, the uh, statistics I showed you on the previous slide. 50% of all heart attacks, somewhere between 50 to 75% of all strokes, are due to high blood pressure. These BHF statistics in England in 2019, you can see the percent of the population with hypertension. And hypertension is high blood pressure, with blood pressures of 140 over 80 and above. And you can see the pattern between men and women is identical to the cardiovascular disease mortality statistics. Hypertension is driving the cardiovascular disease mortality, and that means that there must be some specific differences between, in blood pressure regulation between men and women that we haven't quite uh, got to grips with that is driving this. It's important because the medicines that are available uh, to treat hypertension have been largely tested in men, so it means that we have not been serving women well for these many, many years. <clears throat> 
Well, this is some data actually that was generated by my colleague, Vikas Kapil. He was doing a PhD with me at the time. He's a clinician, a clinical pharmacologist. He's now a senior uh, lecturer in clinical pharmacology at Barts um, at, the, at the Faculty of Medicine and uh, Dentistry and a consultant in, in cardiovascular internal medicine. This data Vic generated when we were exploring um, the possible uh, blood pressure lowering effects of inorganic um, nitrate. It was mentioned in my uh, introduction. It's one of the areas of my, my lab. This just shows baseline characteristics of the cohort that he recruited. Um, we recruited young people. I have to tell you the truth. They were all medical students. Um, they, were, they were willing <laughs> and happy to do the study. Uh, you can see there are some obvious differences in their BMI. But there are massive differences in blood pressure here. This is systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. These individuals are healthy volunteers, yet already we're seeing that the men have much higher healthy blood pressure than women. Indeed, these young men are very, very dangerously close to the levels of blood pressure that have been identified as predictive of moving into hypertension in the later years close to 130 over 80. So worrying, but importantly highlighting that there are big differences in blood pressure regulation between men and women. Well, we know that blood pressure is determined by two key factors, cardiac output, that's the work of the heart, and peripheral resistance. And that's the resistance of blood flow as it's flowing through the circulation. And resistance is largely determined by the resistance vasculature. These are the smaller arteries that actually penetrate our organs and perfuse them and provide them with oxygen and nutrients. Um, the vascular tone of resistance arteries is primarily determined by the sympathetic innervation that penetrates the walls of those resistance arteries. These neurons release catecholamines that cause an increase in intracellular calcium of the smooth muscle that they're innovating. And this causes smooth muscle to contract and therefore the blood vessel to vasoconstrict. When it vasoconstricts, this then creates a resistance to blood flowing through the blood vessel. This contractile activity of the sympathetic nervous system is constantly buffered by an endothelium-derived vasodilator influence. The endothelium is activated by blood flowing through the blood vessel. It creates a shear stress, a frictional force at the, at the, on the intraluminal side of the endothelium, and this triggers the endothelium to release three different vasodilators that act to constantly buffer this vasoconstrictor nature of the sympathetic nervous system. And this plays an important role in maintaining healthy, open blood vessels that keep essentially our blood pressure down. Well, in my group, we've been very interested in um, the nature of those factors and how they operate and function. And we're interested because what we know about cardiovascular disease, that one of the earliest signs of impending disease is a dysfunction of the endothelium. And that dysfunction is due to a loss of the protective activity of endothelial um, uh, mediators. These two, prostacycline and nitric oxide, are two of those three endothelium-derived vasodilators. A great deal is known about these. I'm not going to talk much about them, except to say that prostacycline is generated in the endothelium by the activity of cyclooxygenase 1, and nitric oxide is generated by the activity of the endothelial isoform of nitric oxide synthase. These factors pass through to the underlying smooth muscle, interact with their cognate receptors, IP for prostacycline, soluble guanylal cyclase, also known as GC1 for nitric oxide. They elevate cyclic nucleotides and lead to smooth muscle relaxation. That's how they provide that opposing influence to the sympathetic innovation. But in this talk, I'm going to talk about the third vasodilator, and that is EDHF. It's, uh, EDHF stands for endothelium-derived hyperpolarizing factor. Um, and, it's still, and, and the fact that we're using an acronym and a very generic term tells you something about the controversy in the field with regards to its identification. 
the controversy exists, but actually there have been some um, uh, excellent researchers who've worked using a range of tools that we have available to us to delineate the signaling pathway for EDHF activity. People like Arthur Weston, Chris Garland, Tudor Griffiths, um, Paul Van Hoot, these individuals help us, have helped us to understand the exact signaling pathway for EDHF, even if we can't agree on what it actually is. What we know is that when the endothelium is triggered by sheer stress or by circulating hormones, the EDHF is released, and this is associated with uh, potassium efflux that um, emanates from the, uh, these two calcium-dependent potassium channels, the SKCA and IKCA. Uh, there are specific drugs that uh, have confirmed that they're involved, that we use in vitro, that there is an increase in the um, uh, potassium levels within the um, space in between the endothelium and the smooth muscle. And this is associated with activation of the sodium-potassium ATPase and an inwardly rectifying potassium channel that leads to hyperpolarization of the smooth muscle and further relaxation. Again, these tools have been critical, but actually all of the experiments that have helped us to understand the EDHF signaling pathway have been done um, by eliminating nitric oxide and prostacyclin from the experimental environment. And this has been done using non-selective inhibitors of nitric oxide synthase and cyclooxygenase. The vast majority of the research that has led to this very clear understanding of the EDHF signaling pathways has come from in vitro experimentation. You simply can't take toxins in vivo, and certainly these drugs are not selective for the endothelial isoforms of the enzymes. It's impossible in vivo to tell whether the effects that one sees uh, are due to EDHF or some other um, uh, unrelated effect on isoforms expressed in other regions of the body. So despite the fact that we know the signaling pathway well, the true in vivo significance with regards to blood pressure was largely unknown until... Uh, I collaborated with a good colleague of mine, he's actually sitting in the audience, Adrian Hobbs. We decided that we would create what we called the EDHF mouse. And this was a mouse um, that uh, we felt would provide us with an environment where we could look at the activity of EDHF in vivo. And what we did is capitalised on the work of uh, those individuals that had generated the ENOS deficient mouse, mouse and the COX-1 deficient mouse, that's Huang and um, uh, Oliver Smithies and um, Langenbach. We crossed those mice um, and did repeat um, crossing of the progeny until we generated mice that were doubly deficient in both ENOS and COX-1. Now, I have to admit a terrible, terrible fact at this moment. So this was early 2000s, so please don't hold this against me. We did what everybody else did at the time. We didn't think about the female animals, we took the male animals, and we started off by doing the classical in vitro experiments that everyone did to study EDHF. And actually, it was a massive disappointment. We thought that what we were going to do is create mice where there was a substantial EDHF response that we could then start interrogating. These are resistance. These are data from resistance arteries taken from, whoops, uh, from um, the mesenteric resistance vasculature. And if you look at the first two bars uh, of the wild-type mice, these are uh, arteries that have been pre-contracted, and then acetylcholine, which is an endothelium-dependent vasorelaxant agent, applied. And you can see that in these male arteries, there's a prominent relaxation response, as we would have expected. However, when we um, looked at ENOS knockout mice, you can see that this response is profoundly reduced, implicating nitric oxide as an important mediator of this response some reduction when we use the COX-1 knockout mice, but the response was almost completely absent in our mice that were doubly deficient of both those isoforms. 
So it meant that we had a piddling response that we really just didn't make studying EDHF um, very easy. And you can see that in the different genotypes that if we used either indomethacin or L name, uh, indomethacin in the ENOS knockouts, the remaining response was completely blocked. Um, if we took the COX-1 knockouts, used L name, the NOS inhibitor, we completely blocked the response. So that told us that in males, EDHF has practically no role to play in endothelium-dependent relaxation. And I suppose you could call it an act of desperation or a, 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 an opportunity or a fortuitous opportunity, um, but it was also because we were wasting. I mean, the, <coughs> this breeding process was necessary to generate the double E deficient animals, but not using the female mice was actually really a scandal. And so we decided that we would repeat the experiment in the same uh, type of artery in females. And I know this is a busy slide, but just focus on the open bar and the gray shaded bar. You can see here immediately that in these female arteries, if we added the l name indomethacin cocktail, we, we only suppressed the acetylcholine-induced relaxation by about 20%. Hooray! it meant the EDHF was the likely mediator of that response. And then when we looked in each of the different deleted mice, you can see that the cocktail actually didn't really affect the response. It was slightly reduced, but it wasn't inhibited any further. This, in this doubly deficient animal, this relaxation is due entirely to EDHF. We confirmed this by using those Drugs that others have identified were effective inhibitors of the EDHF signaling pathway. Um, uh, raising extracellular plus potassium also blocks the EDHF, and you can say they see that they um, profoundly suppressed the response. So what we had discovered in this fortuitous experiment is that EDHF is an important endothelium uh, dependent vasodilator in the resistance arteries of females, but certainly not in males. Well, we wanted to confirm in vivo that this made a difference to blood pressure responses. And we used bradykinin, which is an endothelium-dependent vasodilator, to look at blood pressure responses. This is a, the top is a typical trace from a female uh, double knockout mouse, and this is a male double knockout mouse. You can see there's a dose-dependent decrease in blood pressure. These are anesthetized mice uh, and instrumented. Um, and absolutely no response in the males. And that's the summary data. Okay, so EDHF is important for mediating blood pressure lowering responses to an endothelium dependent vasodilator. What does that mean for baseline blood pressure? Does it make any difference? And the answer to that, of course, I wouldn't be telling you this story if it wasn't, is that yes, of course it is. This shows each of the different knockouts female in open bars, male in the um, uh, filled bars. And you can see that for each genotype, whilst the females are completely normotensive, the males, when they're deficient in ENOS and when they're doubly deficient in both isoforms, are certainly hypertensive, slightly more in the doubly deficient animal. I know you may not agree with me, but just um, humor me. Okay, well, um, actually, Adrian has his own separate research program. Uh, but he was interested in EDHF because of um, this thing here, actually, C-type natriuretic peptide. And we helped him um, publish a few papers that have demonstrated without doubt uh, and with the use of a number of different genetically um, transgenic mouse models that CMP, C-type natriuretic pe peptide from the endothelium, is binding to an MPRC receptor to result in hyperpolarization that mediates EDHF responses in females but not males and plays an absolutely critical role in regulating blood pressure. So there are many that argue about the identity of EDHF, but there is no question that CMP plays an important role. Um, I had a, a PhD student funded by uh, the Bart's charity, Melissa Chan. She's now a senior scientist at the Framingham Institute in the US. And actually, Melissa's PhD was all about trying to understand what was causing the upregulation of EDHF in comparison to males in the females? And what she discovered is that um, females expressed 
substantially more um, of the uh, endothelial pathways for, for EDHF, the SKCA and IKCA, and that this was driven by the activity, actually, of estrogen. I don't have the time to show you the data here today, but um, great paper in, published in British Journal of Pharmacology. But what's also true about these endothelial factors is that they're not just simply vasodilators. As I mentioned, these factors, at least certainly for prostacyclin and nitric oxide, there is a wealth of literature that shows that these factors are critical not just for keeping blood pressure down, but actually maintaining the patency of our blood vessels by preventing platelet activation and by preventing inflammatory responses. And so, of course, we wondered, could EDHF possibly be responsible for this influence in females? So um, we decided to focus on the inflammation. I'm going to show you the data with regards to looking at inflammation. And we used mouse models uh, to look at inflammatory responses in mice. This was work done by Conchi Villar, who was funded by a BHF project grant in my lab. Uh, she's actually now a senior uh, in vivo researcher at AstraZeneca. And Conchi used this model that was actually um, developed by a colleague of mine at, at Barts, uh, Professor Mauro Peretti, where one injects air under the skin of the mouse and it creates this rather cool little pouch into which one can inject inflammagens, inflammatory stimuli that um, lead to an influx of fluid and leukocytes. And what one can do is wash out that pouch and actually uh, analyze the pouch contents. And that's exactly what Conchi did. We used interleukin-1 beta that plays an absolutely critical role in the acute inflammatory response, but has also been substantially implicated in the progression of cardiovascular disease. We know that systemic inflammation precedes disease, and IL-1 beta is one of the key uh, inflammatory cytokines in that setting. And you can see here, she took um, male and female um, uh, litter uh, match mice, and um, you can see while IL-1 beta caused a profound leukocyte infiltrate into the pouch that the female's largely unresponsive, and this was at a four-hour time point. What she also did in this experiment is actually took half of the females and ovariectomized them, and you can see that the removal of the ovaries resulted in a phenotype that almost was identical to the male mice. So this is ovarian hormones driving uh, this difference in the inflammatory response. Well, we wanted to look a little bit more closely at what step of the leukocyte recruitment paradigm might be different between the sexes. Um, and this is a, a famous cartoon from a Nature Immunology Review uh, published by Klaus Ley. It shows that the leukocyte rolls, adheres, and then once adherent, it commits its fate to margination. And we can use the in vivo method of intravital microscopy to focus in on venules and look at this paradigm in real time in anesthetized mice. And that's exactly what we did. We took male and female mice. Uh, we injected them intraperitoneally with IL-1 again. And we followed um, leukocyte rolling uh, and adherence. And this is just a, a, one of the images that we generated. You can see here a leukocyte rolling along here. This one is actually starting to commit its adherence, and you can see some that have emigrated here. But what's clearly obvious is that there are way fewer cells rolling along the endothelium of venules in females compared to males, and that this leads on to a knock-on effect of reduced adherence. So the difference is taking place at the very earliest stages of leukocyte recruitment. Well, Conchi then actually took a few of the mesenteries, uh, did some simple H&E staining, and here again, this is a venule here, and you can see that these leukocytes are polymorphonuclear uh, cells. Uh, this is uh, one that's actually starting uh, to adhere. Here, another one that's flat, and you can see here, I don't know how visible this is, but this is a PMN in the extravascular space. We know that these PMNs are neutrophils, because Conchi assayed for myeloperoxidase, which is a neutrophil-specific um, peroxidase. And you can see that um, in supernatants of the mesentery, she showed that there was a time-dependent increase in MPO activity that essentially matches this leukocyte rolling and adherence um, time course. 
and we saw uh, a very much reduced response in the females. Well, another postdoc of mine, again funded by a separate grant from the British Heart Foundation uh, project grant, uh, helped us to look at these responses a little bit further. Um, we uh, uh, took sham and ovariectomized uh, female mice and explored the response to interleukin-1 beta again. And you can see that in the absence of the ovaries, there was um, uh, a response to interleukin-1 that was very similar to the response that we had achieved in the males here at the same time point, at the four hour time point, about 30, 32, 33 cells per minute rolling along the endothelium. I want to highlight an important point here, and this shows the importance of conducting, when you're using a surgical model, of conducting a sham control. If you look at the sham controls here, the shams, no response to IL-1, but look at this, the control animal. Here, there are somewhere in the region about 14, 15 cells rolling per minute. If you go back here, I know it doesn't sound by, uh, like a lot, but it is actually. If this is the healthy female mouse, it's below 10. It's sitting at somewhere around 8. So the surgery itself did change the environment, um, so it was important to do sham control in that setting. What we did, uh, what Rayaman next did is actually uh, we used uh, osmotic mini pumps um, from which estrogen was released, estradiol was released, and you can see that um, in, by restoring estrogen levels in the ovariectomized mice, we substantially attenuated that leukocyte rolling response to interleukin 1 beta. And finally, we wanted to make sure that this wasn't just some freaky deaky response to IL-1, that actually it was something that was um, pertinent for other inflammatory uh, stimuli. And we repeated the experiments looking at male and female mice using uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, another cytokine that has been implicated as a very important mediator of cardiovascular disease. And you can see that there is an identical phenotype to the one that we saw between the sexes uh, to interleukin-1 beta. Well, what about EDHF? Does it have any role to play in this response? Well, we went back to our different uh, genetic deletion mice, and you can see that in the COX-1 knockout mice, the, the females don't respond. Um, so it's certainly not prostacycline that is uh, attenuating that response. In the ENOS knockout mice, there was a small response, but it certainly wasn't at the magnitude of the response to interleukin-1 beta in the males. Um, so the females were still protected. And you can see that in each case in the males, there's a prominent response to uh, the cytokine in the males, but also a raised leukocyte rolling here in the ENOS knockout mice. But in the doubly deficient mice, you can see that the females still maintain their protection. We did a time course just to be sure here in these experiments. While the males are responding to interleukin-1, the females are not. It is EDHF that is inhibiting that leukocyte recruitment. I can tell you again that Adrian and his group have gone on to demonstrate that the EDHF doing this in part is C-type natriuretic peptide. But as I said, whenever I do this kind of preclinical experimental work, I seek opportunities to translate to the clinical setting. And that's exactly what we did next. Uh, my colleague, Vic Kapil, um, went and learned uh, two separate models of inflammation that we could um, construct in healthy volunteers. And we looked at the differences between the sexes in this response. And this is just the, the paper that we ultimately published. Krishna Raj was a, a PhD um, student, a cardiologist doing a PhD with me, funded by the NIHR at the time. He did all of the work that I'm going to show you. He's now actually, um, after getting an NIHR ACL, is a, a, has got his permanent post and is a senior lecturer only last month uh, at Bart's in the London uh, and a consultant cardiologist at the Trust, at Bart's Trust. So... The first model that we used um, was the uh, cantharidin-induced blister model. This was a model developed by Tony Sing Siegel at UCL many years ago. Um, cantharidin is a protein that's found in the blister beetle, and it's actually used clinically. It's used to treat warts and verrucas. Um, and what Tony Siegel did is he used cantharidin, applied it to the skin of healthy volunteers, and it creates a blister. 
And from that blister, we can collect the blister fluid and analyze it for cell numbers, but also for inflammatory mediators. Um, and the protocol involves two time points, 24 hour time point after cantharidin application, which shows you the big, strong, acute inflammatory response and a 72 hour time point where the inflammatory response is starting to wane and the inflammation is recovering. Um, we uh, designed the study based upon our preclinical experimental work. The response in females was 50% less than the response in males. And that is exactly how we did our power calculations, expecting 50% less neutrophils in the blisters in uh, females compared to males. Uh, when we collected the 24-hour blisters, what was clear almost immediately was that both men and women could mount a strong inflammatory response. But actually, it turned out that it was identical. There was no difference. Again, massively disappointing. This seems to be part of my research life, <laughs> that the first experiments, the hypothesis we're testing, we're wrong. Um, I'll show you the data that confirms that in just a moment. But the absolutely brilliant finding in this study was that the 72-hour blisters in 60% of the women, there was no blister at 72 hours. It had completely <coughs> resolved. There was no sign of it. It hadn't popped. Uh, the males, pesky males, are not very good at looking after their blisters. You can clearly identify a popped blister. But um, uh, there were no resolved blisters in the males whatsoever. And when we looked at the, we interrogated the blister a little bit more closely, this confirms what I've just said to you, the 24 hour blister, no difference in blister fluid volume, no difference in total cell number within the blister, no difference in neutrophil numbers, an absolutely shocking finding and certainly not what we were expecting. Um, you can also see reduced blister volume at 72 hours, a hint that maybe there are lower um, cell numbers in, in the 72 hours in the females here, but again, no change in neutrophil numbers. What was different were the number of inflammatory monocytes. And inflammatory monocytes um, perpetuate the acute inflammatory response. They're key in responding to the inflammatory trigger and are the second cell they're really after neutrophils. Um, we did a whole host of other experiments, um, mechanistic studies, to try and tease apart exactly what was going on here. And what we found is that with the reduced inflammatory monocytes, there was a protected number of the anti-inflammatory monocytes. They have a different phenotype, and we can uh, separate them out. But what we also found is that whilst the neutrophil numbers were identical at the 24-hour time point, in the females, the neutrophils were distinctly and significantly less activated. They had been already turned off. We measured a number of different mediators in the blister fluid. This was an unbiased array externally conducted. And we found a number of anti-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines that were raised in the female blisters at 24 hours versus the male blisters. So what does this mean for the cardiovascular system? Well, actually, there's a second model that we set up, and that's um, systemic inflammation-induced vascular dysfunction. And this is where the typhoid vaccine comes in. This is a model that was developed by Arun Hingarani and Patrick Valance at UCL many years ago. Um, whoops, I've lost the mouse again. And uh, essentially what they did is used brachial um, artery ultrasound measurements to measure the brachial artery diameter before uh, and then after uh, the release of a cuff of the lower arm. When that cuff is inflated, it's stops flow. When it is released, what happens is that there is an increase in flow through the brachial artery. Whoops, I'm just at the cartoon here now, sorry. Brachial artery, an increase in shear stress that uh, is thought to trigger the release of nitric oxide that then causes a vasodilation. And that's what you see here. This is the flow-mediated dil dilation response. And then what uh, Arun, uh, Professor Hingarani next showed is that after eight hours, eight hours after the administration of the typhoid vaccine, this induced a systemic inflammation which was associated with a significant reduction in that FMD response. 
We know that this relates to endothelial dysfunction um, and not smooth muscle cell dysfunction because he conducted some controls. This is GTN, it's an organic nitrate and an NO donor that delivers NO to the smooth muscle independent of endothelial cell activation. And you can see no change in the response here. So we designed our study to have equal numbers of both men and women subjected to uh, FMD and typhoid vaccine. We ha also had a 32-hour time point. This is a transient systemic inflammation, and the individuals do recover. And that's reflected in this data, which shows the uh, blood differentials um, uh, after typhoid vaccination and CRP levels. You can see it's not a serious systemic inflammation, but... In both sexes, after typhoid vaccine, there's an increase in circulating white blood cell count. Um, we used two-way analysis of variance with sex as a factor here. Both, we saw an increase in white blood cell count in both the men and women, no difference between the sexes. And this increase was driven almost entirely by an increase in neutral circulating uh, numbers. And again, no difference in numbers, quite different to the mouse air pouch and the intravital microscopy, but those studies were the precursor to doing these studies in healthy volunteers. So what about FMD? Um, so the flow-mediated dilatation response in the two sexes was very similar at baseline. After eight hours, you can see that the males suffered vascular dysfunction. The females, in contrast, surprisingly showed an improvement in their uh, vascular function, which was a definite surprise. And this just shows the change in the FMD response um, from baseline comparing the two sexes, which is how we powered our study. We know that this is endothelial dysfunction because this is the response to GTN in the males and the females of the vaccine. Um, we then went on to do a whole host of um, uh, mechanistic studies, biochemical analyses of the blood, and we found that whilst the neutrophil numbers were elevated in both sexes, actually the activation state of the neutrophil was reduced in the female at the eight-hour time point in comparison to the males, and that this was associated with an increase in the anti-inflammatory monocyte um, expression associated also with the expression of a number of uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines that accelerate the recovery um, to an inflammatory response. There is a paradigm now where the resolution of inflammation is recognized as an active process. This is a lovely cartoon that came from a review published in Circ Research a few years ago. But essentially, you have your inflammatory stress and trigger. It causes neutrophils to get to the site where that stress is taking place. They start to attack uh, and deal with the, the cause of the, uh, uh, the recruitment of those cells. Some of these cells become apoptotic. Um, macrophages started to start to engulf those apoptotic cells. But this results in further signals that recruit more pro-inflammatory monocytes. But at a certain part, point, that atherocytosis actually triggers a switching of the macrophages from a pro-inflammatory to a pro-resolving phenotype. What we think is happening is that um, uh, in females, there's an upregulation of the expression of these macrophages, that these lead to an increase in anti-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, and that this then results in the reduced activation of PMNs and the the accelerated recovery of the inflammatory response. We're currently exploring this in studies in patients with coronary artery disease and comparing that to age-matched um, healthy volunteers. And hopefully I'll have some more ideas on the actual targets, um, possibly for estrogen in this setting. So finally, in the last few minutes of my um, presentation, a focus on the work that we did at the British Journal of Pharmacology, trying to ad address that issue that I mentioned to you of the, the sex bias in research. Um, we know that pharmacology also, um, there's a great deal of sex bias in the published uh, literature. But at the journal, we decided that we would take a look at what the issues were and then think about what we might be able to do to support the research community in changing their ways. So what are the issues? Well, actually, when we were exploring uh, all of the issues driving sex bias, it became clear that um, there are a number of issues 
specifically pertaining to preclinical research, but that the, there is a very prominent sex bias in clinical research that in some way has influenced what we do at the preclinical setting. Um, and this is driven uh, in large part, um, drives in large part the reduced number of women that are recruited into clinical trials. And the, the reduced number of women relates to the concerns about risks, the risks of harm to women, but also to the potential unborn fetus. I mean, the experience of the thalidomide scandal is something that we are still living with. Um, and actually, even though over the past 10 years or so, there's definitely raised awareness that there is a sex bias in clinical research, and we absolutely have to do something about it, the underrepresentation of women in trials persists. And it persists because people are concerned. But also, we think it persists because actually the design of clinical trials that includes uh, sex as a factor is not well enough developed yet. There are lots of people that are on the, bit on the job, um, but we're, we're waiting uh, to hear outcome for clinical trials, how that's going to run. The preclinical researchers have some good ideas, and I think the clinical world could learn from them. Um, and I think this is in part uh, underlies the clinical setting. And it is a big problem, and it's something that we absolutely have to do something about. And this data here, these numbers, give you a good reason for why we need to do something about it. Uh, in the period between 1997 and 2000, 10 medications were withdrawn by the FDA from the US market. Eight of them were because of safety issues in women. And the reason those safety issues uh, occurred and that weren't suspected is because women weren't involved in the trials and females weren't involved in the preclinical research that preceded it. So what about the preclinical research setting? Well, I've said already, uh, the majority of preclinical research, uh, there is a sex bias. Um, and this is largely due to this perception, um, the, this impression that there is greater variability in females. Um, this is actually controversial and, in fact, has now been refuted by a number of prospective and robust studies. It seems that the neuroscientists and the psychopharmacologists are way ahead of the rest of us, um, but they have already done a great deal of work in this area showing that this just simply isn't true. And we do need to do something about it because, if anything, I hope that my presentation so far has told you that there are major differences in the biology uh, between the sexes and also the molecular mechanisms of drug action. So we cannot rely on studies just in male animals. Of course, there is also that terrible serious ethical problem that hit us when we were doing those studies in the doubly deficient mice. The surplus breeding and waste of female animals is simply unconscionable. And now we've been woken up to it, we ca cannot continue in, in, in that way. But one of the big problems that is holding people back is understanding how sex as a factor can be included in experimental design. So at BJP, we wanted to take a look at what we had been doing in the past um, and uh, determine whether pharmacology was plagued with this sex bias as much as, as um, uh, the perceived view in other disciplines. Um, so we did an audit. Now, we assumed the worst because one of the great pharmacology uh, leaders of the past, Lewis, in his book, The Textbook of Pharmacology, told us all in 1960 that we must make sure that the animals that we use in our studies are from the same strain of similar age, weight, and sex. And I have to tell you that we obliged in the pharmacology research community. This is just some data from the very first issue in BJP uh, and an issue that was from BJP in 2019. Uh, you can see that in 1946, they didn't much care what sex they were using for their experiments. There was absolutely no mention. And if they did mention the sex, it was predominantly that the animal was male. In 2019, we were doing a little bit better, thankfully. At least we were saying the sex, but it turns out that all we're doing is using males for our studies, uh, certainly in the material published in the British Journal of Pharmacology, over 50% um, of the papers. And in fact, this is a terrible indictment from a, a group that have actually done quite a lot to raise the alarm for sex bias in 
in biomedical research, Zika, Prendergast and Beery, um, they did an analysis published just in 2022 of historical trends globally in biomedical preclinical research. And you can see that you know, in the early 1900s, nobody really bothered saying anything about sex, that by the um, 1970s that that had decreased, thankfully, but it turns out that all that people were doing were using male animals in their studies, and this has largely persisted. Perhaps the most frightening bit of data from this is that it turns out that the pharmacologists are the ones who are doing uh, the worst out of all of us. The neuroscientists are pretty good. In 2009, um, you can see that about 25% of the, their published material used both sexes in their studies. Um, that, that has massively increased, more than doubled in 2019. Uh, the pharmacology community actually has decided to resist. And if anything, we've heard decided that we absolutely will not work on female animals. Shame on us. So what we did at BJP is try to change the rhetoric uh, led by two of those wonderful senior editors, Jim Doherty and the wonderful Claire Stanford, who is the previ previous recipient of the Paddock Lecture and is sitting in the audience. Um, Jim and Claire led um, an editorial that we put together, the senior editorial board and myself, uh, mandating a new change to publication of articles in BJP, where we required that sex needed to be considered as an experimental variable, where we actually gave some good advice on how one might be able to do that uh, by using factorial design. Um, and we also insisted that uh, there must be some discussion of the relevance of findings um, for both sexes. In the, uh, at the end of the manuscript. We took a pragmatic approach. We recognised that um, publications or articles that were being submitted to the journal um, were uh, the work of the previous, could be two, three, four years. We would accept papers with only a single sex, but would require full justification and discussion uh, and these, um, this was a mandate that we um, published in 2019. Now, what we did um, during my tenure as uh, ESC at BJP is we introduced guidelines um, and then we assessed how well we were doing. Um, so a few years later, 2022, uh, we decided to determine whether had we really eliminated sex bias with these new mandated guidelines. We wanted to know whether researchers were more aware of the importance of considering sex, whether they were actually incorporating sex as a factor in their experimental design with a view to providing um, a, a change in the um, published material and improved reproducibility and, of course, transparency. Uh, Claire led uh, the publication, which came out uh, earlier this year in 2023. Um, you can take a look at it. We discuss our results. Uh, and now for the results. Oh, goodness, Claire, I'm going to show everyone. Um, in fact, the story is good and then not so good. So what Claire did is audited um, the journal back to 2014. It was an enormous amount of work. And you can see that what we were doing in um, the years from 2014 is largely doing experiments in males only. Uh, when we introduced the change in 2019, we actually saw this really rapid change in the numbers, a decrease in males only. And you can see here increase in the use of females. And these were being used with both sexes largely in our publications. Um, it improved a bit more in 2020, and then what must have happened is we took our foot, we put our foot on the brakes, and we stopped accelerating, and we're starting to see a decrease in 2021 and the 2022, and a reversion to type, it does seem. So what this highlights is that it's absolutely essential to remain vigilant that when we introduce guidelines, the audit is really important. Publication of the audit and sharing of our data, absolutely essential. And hopefully when they do the next audit in another two or three years time, uh, everyone, uh, the data will look much, much better. Fingers crossed. Um, 
Actually, an important aspect is, of course, teaching and training, and I've had the wonderful pleasure of working uh, with this uh, uh, individual researcher here, Natasha Karp. She's a leading light internationally in highlighting the issues around sex bias. Natasha is a senior statistician at AZ, and Natasha, together with her colleague, another statistician, Ben Phillips, have created a training uh, module um, at the request of the UKRI, working with the MRC to support researchers in introducing sex as an experimental variable. And we trialled that training at uh, a recent international uh, conference for pharmacologists that I was Secretary General for, uh, for earlier uh, in the year. Uh, and what we also did at the same time, with the help of Brianna Gaskill, is actually look to see the impact, what the impact of that training, in fact, was on the individuals who attended it. We did a survey before and after the training, as well as surveying conference participants. Uh, we are actually repeating the workshop in London at Barts uh, in the new year, so that we have a sufficient sample size and we will publishing, be publishing the outcome uh, of this uh, test case in, in 2024. Uh, it's been wonderful uh, working with this group of individuals. We actually also got some PhD students at the conference to help us, uh, and they did a fantastic job in collecting the surveys too, so thank you to, to all of them. It's not all bad news. The research community in the UK is waking up. There is absolutely no question. The NIH were the first off the blocks. They uh, mandated a change to their uh, grant submission process in 2015, where they insisted on uh, sex being considered as a, as they say, biological variable, but Claire very rightly uh, highlighted that it's experimental variable um, in the design of their experiments. They did survey the panel members a few years later after the introduction of the um, mandate. And there was a small improvement in consideration of sex as an experimental variable. Again, highlighting the need that we have to keep pressing on the accelerator, keep pushing if we want to bring about change. It'll be slow, but it will eventually happen. And the same is actually happening in the UK. The UKRI just earlier this year publish their mandate that sex has to be part of experimental design, the preclinical level, the clinical level, and this includes in vitro cell experimental work too. Um, the cardiovascular world has also woken up uh, that this is an important issue. Those numbers that I showed you from the BHF statistics, clearly women are dying from cardiovascular disease uh, eventually. And we don't have treatments currently that, is, that caters directly for their disease. The medications that we have have only been tested largely, essentially, in men. Uh, and this commission, organised by The Lancet, published a number of recommendations. Well, there are loads. You can't read those. But the fact is that there are so many. I had to make it tiny so it got onto the slide. But there are two um, uh, main, main areas that I think uh, I feel that I've contributed, I hope to contribute to in the for future, that I think are absolutely critical. Firstly, we need to develop educational programs. And hopefully, the work that I'm doing with Natasha will lead to something tangible that uh, leads to benefit. Secondly, I hope that the work that I've shown you today um, uh, has left you with the view that I have contributed in some small way to understanding the differences between the sexes. But absolutely, it's the funders that need to fund this research. And it is true that historically, they have rejected these grants, but there has been a change. There is a change. There are calls coming from charities and from the UKRI to uh, submit grants focused on this particular issue. So hopefully we'll see funding for this really important area of work. Just to acknowledge all of the funders of the work um, uh, and the support that I've received uh, for the work that I've presented today. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. I hope that you're not disappointed that it wasn't racy uh, and that you found something useful in my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alawalia, for an outstanding presentation, just highlighting the importance of the, you know, uh, the interaction between human and non-human animal research and uh, the benefits that that could lead, um, and also just this uh, blatant bias. I think you were over, overly flattering on the neuroscientific field. I mean, a lot of folks are still not reporting, so I think they, they also have a lot to do.
We've got time for some questions, please, if you have for the speaker. couldn't help but notice in the um, analysis done by Claire that um, the moment you put out that idea of you've got to report the sex and you should be including females as well as males, what you actually got was a lot of papers that didn't report the sex. Yeah, we did get more papers. We did see an increase in the total number, the proportion of the total number that didn't report, report sex. But the upside of that was that we did actually see more, less, that we're using males only and an increase in the numbers of females being used. Um, you know, you put in guidelines and it, it requires the team. I did say it was an excellent editorial board, and they are. But, you know, the editorial boards, certainly of the journal that I was editor-in-chief of, they do that work voluntarily, and it's in addition to everything else that they do. And so, so sometimes I think there are articles that slip through the net. But the audit is really important because it highlights those papers and highlights that we need to be extra vigilant to make sure that that isn't happening. But, I mean, it's shocking that yeah. there was no reported sex. Uh, so I'm a lay member of uh, AWERB up in Manchester, mm. and I'm just wondering if what role you think AWERB has in sort of dealing with this inherent sex bias that seems to be so prevalent, shockingly prevalent actually, um, if any, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. I mean, you guys should be pushing it. I mean, it's, it's absolutely... We should, the, the, the baseline position should be the equal numbers of males and females are used in all experiments. For the, the first question, you need to be doing that. That should be your blanket starting point. If, when you've done that, it's clear that there are no sex differences, then you probably need to continue with both sexes in your studies. If there are prominent sex differences, then that is the rationale for doing a sex specific study if you really want to interrogate pathways. But the A word is critical. You have an opportunity to make a difference here at the university if when people are applying for their project licenses, they're told this is simply unacceptable. You need to include both sexes. Well, they'll do it because you won't approve their, um, you guys in the committees, within the ethics committees, you're in a position to actually influence that outcome. So you have to use your position of power to steer researchers in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, I often point that out as a lay member, and the answer that comes back is, there's always an answer, and there's always an excuse, and I don't have the skills, I don't have a scientific background at all, so I can't actually press them on it. So I just think AWERBs, and lay members in particular, need some sort of support, something. Some data. Oh, actually, just support, there's... just just a way to actually press this point because I think it's really critical. I have to, I always ask this question. Well, I don't get anywhere. The excuses generally are incorrect. They say that it costs more uh, and that it's not relevant uh, and that there's increased variability in females. Actually, a lot of those issues have been proven incorrect or debunked now. And actually, what what could be done is some summary information that supports individuals like yourself in making that case. And I mean, I think universities in particular have to move their position. They have to say that it's unacceptable not to be considering, not to be balancing your experimental work at the early stages. Um, it simply has to move into that, that position. Thank you. Um, just a plug for the NC3R's experimental design assistant. Oh, you're terrible, okay. Um, ah, there, okay, hi. <laughs> if you could use the microphone, that would yeah, be great. Yeah, it's really echoey. <laughs> um, I wanted to plug the NC3R's experimental design assistant that has the functionality to allow robust experiments using both sexes. No, you're absolutely right. And in so, fact, in our guidance, we did... We, did, we have highlighted the EDA as a really 
uh, excellent online tool that can be used to help design experiments. And, and to and yeah, address the question from the AWERBs, this is what we should be using. The AWERBs should be pressing that the EDA is used for things like this, I would say. Um, while Clive is getting the microphone, I think you had your hand up. Thanks. Um, I'm going to ask you to extrapolate wildly from your research. Sounds like fun. And the question is, um, does the difference in the way that uh, the, the blood vessels respond between the sexes mean that there's a difference in the way they respond to exercise to prevent us from getting heart disease? And does that mean that as a male, I can do less exercise than my wife? <laughs> <laughs> No, absolutely not. It means that your wife probably can do less exercise than you because she has EDHS. That's what I would say, right? Because, hey, I'm a female. Um, I think that the women are protected in the premenopausal years, and it does seem that endothelium-dependent vasodilator influence over their resistance arteries is driven in females by EDHF. We need to work a little bit harder to confirm this in humans, but the preclinical experimental data is very strong and does support that position. Um, when the endothelium is activated by sheer stress, it causes an increase in uh, uh, activation of the endothelial cell, and that will release NO, EDHF, and prostacycline at the same time. What is true about studies exploring endothelial dysfunction in uh, experimental models, both actually in animals and in humans, is that endothelial dysfunction seems to have some preferences over the endothelial mediators. It seems that NO and the pathways for NO generation are a main target in that disease process. So, wild extrapolation since you need enos to protect your resistance arteries and i need edhf and the factors that trigger endothelial dysfunction um, actually seem to target enos and no generation i would say that you're the one who needs to do more exercise than me <laughs> and Rita, really excellent lecture. Um, I just wanted to ask you a more technical question. So you showed that endothelial derived mediators like nitric oxide and prostacycline don't just influence vascular tone, but also can affect platelet leukocyte function. And the lay picture that everyone shows about how leukocytes get out, we now know it's slightly more complicated in that platelets are required for that. <coughs> And I just wondered whether you or anybody else has done anything to understand whether there's a sex difference between how platelet leukocyte interactions occur to lead to those changes in leukocyte infiltration that you saw in your preclinical model. So in preclinical, I'm not sure I've got the answer to that. What's for, sh for sure, platelet reactivity is different between the sexes. Um, Adrian's just raised his eyebrows at me. Of course, in his CMP deleted models, endothelial CMP deletion and the MPLC knockouts, it's quite clear that platelet leukocyte uh, interactions are enhanced in females in the absence of CMP, and that this is something prominently evident in the females versus uh, the males. So there is some evidence that that is happening as well. There, it's true that NO plays a really important part in, in interfering with platelet leukocyte interactions as well. It regulates the expression of key adhesion molecules. And so you will see um, an impact of endothelial dysfunction on platelet reactivity in males and platelet leukocyte aggregate formation too. Uh, I'm not sure if I've completely answered your question there, but I hope I've done it in a roundabout no. way. Thank you. Well, please help me to thank Professor Elwalia for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I'd like to thank, again, uh, the, the Openness Awardees. Congratulations. Um, please consider nominations and you know, nominating yourselves or, or others. Um, and uh, the next um, 
openness, uh, you know, a meeting is going to be at the Francis Crick Institute next December 2nd, so please mark your calendars. Finally, we'd like to invite you for some nibbles and, and drinks out there in the foyer. So thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>